Howdy neighbor, how is your garden growing? Today in my garden, we're gonna be talking about everything you need to know about Everglades tomatoes. I'm gonna to be answering your questions, plus giving you all the tips and advice, not just from me, but also from your fellow gardeners. So let's start with, why should you be growing Everglades tomatoes? These are the best tomatoes I've ever tasted. My father-in-law who grew tomatoes for decades said these are so sweet. My neighbor, Mr. Cliff said these are absolutely the best tomatoes he's ever tasted. My mom said these tomatoes taste so good. They almost taste like a fruit. If you are looking for a tomato to get you started into the world of tomatoes, if you have someone who only kind of likes tomatoes and are debating whether you want to grow a tomato, if you are looking to get kids excited about growing tomatoes, Everglades tomato is the one. When it comes to growing tomatoes in places that get really hot, I'm talking your zone eights, your zone nine, zone tens, elevens. When you live in the subtropics and even the tropics, it can be really tough to grow vegetables, especially tomatoes. But when it comes to plants that are just too too easy to grow, Everglades tomatoes is at the top of my list. And it's not just me who believes this, it's tons of your fellow gardeners who agree, including Kim who says, I have grown them for many years and the yield is ridiculous. Or Red Cherries who said, I planted them last year and never had to buy another one. Or Carolyn who said, Everglades tomatoes are the only tomatoes that I can grow. Oak Anna says, oh my gosh, those are voracious in my garden. I, True Nomi says, I love this plant. I, Dennis says, I started using these three years ago and now they pop up everywhere. Katie says, you'll have volunteers for years. So pass them along to friends. Are you starting to get excited about Everglades tomatoes? But you might be wondering to yourself, but what exactly are Everglades tomatoes? Everglades tomatoes originate out of South America, like all types of tomatoes. And then they made their way up through Central America and, and then eventually got naturalized over here in Florida. But one of the reasons that Everglades tomatoes are so unique is that they're actually a totally different species of tomatoes from the ones that everyone typically grows. So when you're thinking about beefsteak tomatoes and vine ripe tomatoes or any of the types that you get in the grocery store or the seed packets, that these are not the same type of tomatoes. All the types of varieties that most people are growing are actually Solanum lycopersicum. Come. Everglades tomatoes are Solanum pine. <laughs> Everglades tomatoes are Pimpine elifolium. <laughs> I kind of got it. So we're going to jump into the, one of the most asked questions when it comes to Everglades tomatoes. And that's just where can you get them? And the reason it's so tricky is similar to MSGT Boone is that people are looking at Home Depot. They're looking at Lowe's. They've looked at Tractor Supply. They've even looked at some of their local nurseries. They're looking online at Baker's Creek and Johnny Seeds and Southern Exposure and honestly they can't find seeds. So how can we have this great tomato but no one can find the seeds? And the answer is kind of similar to the tomatoes. You can't go big, you have to go small. It's through these local small businesses that we're actually able to get Everglades tomatoes. The places that you might find them is places like the Etsy shops and on Amazon. You can also find them from people like David the Good's daughter, Daisy Good, or, or from Urban Harvest or Jarrah's Garden. There are a handful of growers that you can order the seeds online. Cody Schroeder had a great piece of advice, which is oftentimes public libraries have free seed libraries. Another place that you might find them is actually through local gardening clubs and local gardening societies. And just like Kitty was saying is, is that you can get them from a friend. And honestly, getting them from a friend is one of the best ways to get them, which leads us to one of the next most challenging things when it comes to Everglades tomatoes. You've gotten the seeds, but you can't get them to grow. Like Joe who says, I've tried and tried to get an Everglades tomato plant started, but for some reason it is pretty much the only thing I can't get started. This was actually one of the first tips that Bob gave me when he sent me seeds was he said, put them in the ground, but they're gonna take a long time to get going. So typically when we think about tomato seeds is that they take about seven to 14 days when you have the ideal temperatures. But what's different about Everglades tomatoes is they are a type of tomato that prefers it to be warm. They actually prefer it to be kind of hot. So most tomatoes won't even produce tomatoes once you start having days well above 70 degrees, which is why so many of us who live in zone eight, nine, 10, 11 are looking for something that can handle even more heat. Well, the cool thing about Everglades tomatoes, not only can they handle the heat, they actually prefer the heat, which is why they tend to take longer to get started. One is because we tend to start them at the same time as regular tomatoes, which means it's a little bit cooler than they prefer. The other thing is that similar to the native plants that grow in zone eights through 11 is that they tend to put more time into getting established so that they can really deal with the heat, the humidity, the pests. That's what a lot of my native plants do. And I find that Everglades tomatoes act very similar to a lot of my native plants. 
even if you're struggling to get that first plant going, do not give up because it only takes you getting one plant, just one plant in order to start having tons and tons of tomatoes. So like Stingray was saying here, it's their second season with Everglades. And the first season she thought they would have done more, but they really just kind of hung out. But this spring, right, as everything started to warm up, even get a little hot, they just took off. Let's get more into the nitty gritty of when you start the seeds, what does that actually look like? So not only will these take longer than seven to 14 days, you often will find that Everglades seeds take 21, 28, even over a month, sometimes even two months to get started, depending on what time of year you start them. Steph gave some really good advice. She's in zone 9B. She plants her first seeds in clear plastic 12 ounce cups with two drain holes at the bottom in November indoors. And then again in January indoors and again in March in a shady location. And with Steph's method, she finds that she has a 95% to 100% germination rate. Ray Starshine said, I found I had really good germination rates when I planted them in one of those plastic pastry containers from the grocery store bakery. I put my seeds in a starting mix, planted my seeds, watered the soil, and closed the lid. It created a little greenhouse that really let my seeds bake. They love the heat when germinating. And if you're noticing a theme, there's a lot about heat and humidity. And if those techniques don't work for you, Mariel wanted to tell you she had bad germination rates too. It's not uncommon the first time you try growing Everglades tomato, but then the next year it was so much better. Don't give up in your first attempt. Now these were some great tips if you're getting dry seeds, but if you get fresh seeds, there is a whole different thing that's happening. I have found that when we use fresh seeds, the germination rate is 90 to 100%. Honestly, I found the easiest way to get the seed started was just to set it in the ground and forget it. But also mark it because later when it pops up, you wanna make sure you know it's a, it's an Everglades tomato. How to plant it, how to keep it. I'm not sure how to put this, but basically to let it sprawl or to trellis it. That is the great debate. Some people love letting this plant just go. Others like me, we like to grow it on a trellis. But which should you do? Everglades tomatoes are an indeterminate vine tomato. The vines get 10 to 12 feet tall or long, depending on whether you grow it on the ground or you grow it up a trellis. My trellises are seven and a half feet tall. And yes, they go, go up and start to come on over. Now here are some of the pros and cons I see with the sprawling. One, people feel that when they let it sprawl over the place that they just get lots more tomatoes. And that could be true. I haven't done any studies on this, so I cannot say quantifiably is that true or not. But many people feel like this is a great way to get the maximum production. Also, they just kind of want to have it be like a little bit of wild, a little bit crazy. They don't want to have to fuss at it because sometimes, you know, tomato plants can be fussy and Everglades tomatoes are not fussy. So if you do let it go and sprawl, you're going to get kind of like a shrubby, moundy mess. <laughs> It's a lot. If you let it sprawl, it's not easy to see the tomatoes on the ground. You have to kind of go digging. So if you're really into treasure hunts, this is the way to do it for you. You go looking and surprise, look at how many tomatoes are there. And look, there's more and more and more. And oh my goodness, this plant is 10 feet by 10 feet. So you've got a lot going on. The other reason this could actually be beneficial is that it will reroute at the nodes that are touching the ground. So even more pest resilient, it's gonna make it more resilient to the heat and the water changes and all the things because it has multiple places to suck up nutrition, suck up water. It's a good thing. Now some of the challenges is because it's on the ground and places like Florida during the summer, you might have more mold issues because it rains a lot and you won't get much airflow when it's on the ground. The other thing that I find challenging is that when it's sprawling on the ground, it's really hard to tell when you have ripe tomatoes. So if you're really trying to maximize harvest, even though you're potentially growing more, you might have more difficulty finding or recognizing that there are a lot of tomatoes. And you can compensate for that by the fact that you just are gonna go out there every single day and you're gonna be picking them. Because honestly, once they start producing, it's kind of like a daily activity. Now for trellising, first off, one of the cons is that you need to have a big trellis. This is not your little Home Depot tomato twist kind of trellis. This is a big plant and it takes up a lot of space. I like doing trellising because it just makes it easier to see the tomatoes. And since they produce a lot, it allows me to access the tomatoes without being on the ground as much. And that's kind of an important thing because they grow in the warm and the hot times of year. For places like Georgia, Alabama, Texas, and Florida, you know, we have no seams and sand fleas that jump up out of the ground once it's above 60 degrees which is when this plant's doing its best. And they like to bite your hands if you're all in the ground. And yes, you can wear gloves, but then they'll bite you on the elbow because your arms are so close to the ground. <laughs> There's a lot of biting. It's not fun. They itch for two weeks, not a fan. 
So by getting it up off the ground, plant potentially avoiding pests, I'm avoiding pests, which I enjoy. The other thing is it gives it more airflow. It makes it a little bit more ergonomic. You know, it's just like easier on the body to be at different heights instead of just over crouching on the ground all the time. It also takes up less physical space. It takes up less horizontal space and more vertical space. And you can keep it a little bit more tidy and organize when you have it on a trellis. But you can get really creative with these plants, like Trev, who actually had some of these come up near his pruned lemon tree, and he's allowing them to trellis up on the tree. But Mickey was saying she found that trellising can be a bit challenging. I find that they just actually kind of grow up and through, and I think this is helped by the fact that the sun hits it from both sides. If you were only getting sunlight from one side, it's gonna naturally just wanna reach for the sun. But when it travels back and forth, it kind of causes them to just grow up and through. But here's the thing, there's not a right or wrong answer. You really just need to think about what works best for you. And if you don't like it, just go the other one. But this brings up the question, you don't have the space to sprawl or to even have a large trellis. Monica Eaton wants to know, can you grow it in a container? And while I have personally never set out to grow them in a container, I have some in a container now, mostly because of the birds. <laughs> and my long and short answer is, I only have some small ones right now in a container and I have never let them get to full height, so I don't know. Robert says he's grown them in bags just fine. He's tried to get them a little tame with bamboo, but they do get really wild. So we found the seeds, we've started the seeds, we've talked about places you can plant them. Some more things that you should know for when, where to plant them is that these are full sun loving plants. They are definitely a subtropical, tropical type tomato. So they can take the four, six or eight hours of sun. They're gonna prefer more of that six to eight hours of sun. Mine are located in a place where they get about six hours of direct sunlight. And really the only time that you need to protect them from the environment would be at the coldest times of the year. Okay, next question, but what about fertilizer? So Sarah was asking, do you fertilize and how often? So me personally, I do not add really any other amendments to my garden. Well, I've got kind of, that's not true. I've got kind of a couple things happening in my front garden that make it very passive fertilizer for me. One, I do back to Eden method, which means I put down lots of wood chips and I allow my millipedes to break them down and give nutrition. So I have taken my very, very, very sandy Florida soil into very rich, dark, yes, soil. In addition, I have plants like sunshine mimosa in the area, which are a nitrogen fixer. So they add even more nitrogen into the soil. It's one of the native plants that I have in my garden, but that's kind of how I am. I try to make things super simple. But if you don't have necessarily the setup I have and you're looking for something more like, here are some other ideas for how you could do it. So when it comes to fertilizer, the e -Wirtz was saying that they put them in the bed, one third parts compost, peat, and vermiculite. They live in South Florida. Another way that you could fertilize it is Steph puts a can of sardines and some lime, then some dirt, and then blood meal, and then bone meal in the hole. Lightly foliar feed all of my garden with Neptune's harvest in the early morning once every two weeks. Oh, and they put out rabbit poop and pee all around their plants. You have a lot of variety from building a more passive system like I do, from Ewerts where it's kind of, you get it set up and then you leave it, to Steph's much more involved process. Again, there's a lot of right ways to do this, but if you're following one of these more involved processes and you might be like Ella who said, watering regularly, I'm giving them sun. I fertilized three times the past three weeks. Anything else I can do, which Carolyn said, just leave them alone. So you finally got the plan started. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you've gotten through all that and hopefully you've taken a more passive approach. You just threw the things in, they started growing and whoop de doo you're ready to transplant them. Now you could have put the seeds right in place. That's actually how I started my first Everglades tomatoes. Or you've started them a cup or like we talked about containers. There's a lot of right ways to do this, but you need to transplant them. Now here's the great thing about Everglades tomato. These plants are so easy to transplant. Honestly, even easier than typical tomatoes. I have ripped these things out of the ground all over the place and then just shoved them back in and then they became that. I mean like I have not babied these things at all. I would recommend planting them lower than whatever your dirt line is because like all tomatoes, even though they're a different species of tomato, like all tomatoes, they can grow roots from anywhere on their stem. So if you find a tomato plant or you've grown a tomato plant, just make sure you take these Everglades tomatoes, put them in the ground and put them another inch or two in just so they have a lot of space to start roots and get themselves established. Wanna know how do you trim, prune, keep them contained? How much is too much? How much is too little? Now, first off, you could be like the people who like to let it sprawl. Those people typically don't prune it at all. More than likely your pruning will be you stepping on the vine and killing sections on accident than anything else. But if you're gonna grow it up a trellis or try to 
contain it a bit. This is probably one of the tomatoes, like you can prune it really hard, like really, really hard. I have almost taken a hedge trimmer to this thing because it gets so prolific. This Everglades tomato will take over not only the top of the trellis, it will come across the entire walkway and go up the other side. This thing is crazy and insane. They grow everywhere. Now, one of the things that's a little different than typical tomato plants, a lot of times when you look at pruning videos for tomato plants, they talk about getting rid of the water sucker. Really the idea behind typical tomato plants is that you're growing these big juicy tomatoes and you have a limited season to get your tomato mature enough so that you can harvest it, right? You're growing these beef steaks and all these other crazy big tomatoes that they grow up north. So what they're trying to do is get rid of as much of the plant as they can so that it forces all of the nutrition and water and energy into that tomato. But you don't live in the north. <laughs> That's why you're growing Everglades tomatoes. These are lots of teeny tiny tomatoes. You don't need to worry about water suckers from a will it develop enough tomatoes because your water sucker vines will honestly grow as many tomatoes as the main vine. It does not matter. The only reason you may want to consider taking out the water suckers is really so you can continue to have airflow, which isn't like that crazy necessary, but more so I would say you may want to just trim some of those off because you can't see the tomatoes. That's usually why I'm trimming them. And if you thought to yourself, wait, I accidentally took off the main vine and not the water sucker, don't worry, it'll keep growing from that too. This is a very forgiving plant. It is a great starter plant. Other than the seed starting part, this plant just like, once you get it going, it is very forgiving of you. So trim away. You can trim off extra leaves. You can leave them on. I've, I've done it both ways. I've taken off lots of the leaves so I can see more of the harvest. I have left all the leaves on. It doesn't seem to make a difference one way or the other from the harvest perspective in how much it makes. More so what it does is it just makes it easier for me to see there are tomatoes so that I can harvest them. Which brings us to the next section. Let's talk about how to harvest. Riley wants to know, how do I know they're ready to be picked before the animals get them? And similar to most tomatoes, you're just looking for them to change color. Except versus when you're dealing with big giant tomatoes, you can pick these as soon as they start turning slightly orange. They won't taste as good, though my neighbor would disagree. He says they taste just as good orange as they do red. And I would agree. Honestly, when they're orange, they probably taste more like a classic tomato. And when they turn red, they're more like, I mean, my goodness, they're almost like a berry at that point. <laughs> I mean, technically they are a berry, but you know what I'm saying? They're, they're very sweet once they're red. So as soon as you see them turn a little bit orange, feel free to grab them. But something to think about, and actually Robert was saying they liked the tip that I gave before, which is to harvest the whole bunch. You'll notice that on your Everglades tomato plant, they, they grow in bunches of like six to eight to 10 little tomatoes. And what a lot of people find is because these tomatoes are thin walled, when they pull them off, the skin tears. This isn't a big deal if you're going to eat them fresh. Like many of your fellow gardeners, many people just eat these as they go around the garden. So there's no issue if it rips a little bit as you're going to eat it. More of the issue is, is if you're going to take it in the house and store it for a little bit, that's where it becomes a challenge because now all the skins are broken and they're going to start spoiling and rotting pretty fast. So what I have found to be very helpful, and I'm glad Robert thinks so too, is that I just harvest the whole little bunch. I just wait for the first couple to start turning orange and then I cut the whole little stem bunch off and I let them finish ripening up on the counter. Now, I had never heard this before, but honeybee has an ingenious way to harvest them. And now I'm ready to try it, which is use a berry picker. Think blueberries, one of those little, <laughs> I'm putting an image up. This is genius. It makes so much sense. I want to try it. This could make your life so much easier because my goodness, once you have a little, you have a lot. You've now tasted your first Everglades tomato. You're like, Mwah, it tastes so good. You may now have the question of how do you use Everglades tomatoes? They are so teeny, they are so tiny, and yet so many. Well, of course, number one answer, most people, we just like to eat them fresh. No tomato is better for eating fresh than an Everglades tomato. They are so sweet. They are so yummy. I also like using these in salads. I know others mentioned that they like using them in salads. Instead of having to cut up some big, chunky, watery, <laughs> tomato you could just pop like five six ten of these into your salad they're great it's actually really convenient you just rinse them off and just boom there they are i've used them in pasta dishes like primaveras but also for those who know my seminal pumpkin fettuccine alfredo which is so delicious we put fresh apple glazed tomatoes on that and the contrast of the really creamy with the pops and bursts of sweetness so good put them on like cauliflower tacos that have like this rich sauce 
Anywhere that you want that, not only a tomato flavor, but a sweet burst of freshness is an amazing place. You should be using these fresh all over the place. You could just pick a bunch of them and snack on them. My goodness, they're so yummy. Other places that I've used them and others have too, fresh salsas, because they're so small and they're thin walled, they don't have a lot of meat to them. So they're not really great for things like tomato paste because you're just gonna cook off um, like so much water. I've also done preserving with these, like doing canned salsa. So you've got a lot of options. I would just say that they don't tend to be as meaty. They tend to be more watery. So fresh and whole is the best way to use them, but you can use them as other things too. Now you love your Everglades tomato and you think to yourself, but I want more. I need more. I have to have more in my life. How do I propagate these? We understand how to start them from seed, but what's next? Which brings us to Wildberry Homestead's question. I see statements online that once you have one, you always have one. Do the plants die off or you simply continually have a plant or plants because volunteers through the fruit falls to the ground? Well, first off, similar to most tomatoes, you can take cuttings of these plants and just stick them in the ground. I'll link a video in the description showing you how you can grow a tomato plant from a tomato plant. It works just as well with Everglades tomatoes. And to answer your question, Melody, yes. Because as many fellow gardeners will tell you, once you have one, you will have many. Melody said, I have seven volunteers. Olga says they come up in different areas every single year. Brian says squirrels will make sure you will have plants next year. And I would agree and say not only the squirrels, but the birds and the possums and the raccoons and any other creature that comes by to your garden will ensure that you will have Everglades tomatoes next year, including yourself. If you have it sprawling or you have it on a trellis, you're bound to miss a tomato and it will come back next year. But I think the other question that you wanted to know was, is do they ever die off? Yes, what is the same about all tomato plants, but also might feel a little different because you live in a subtropical tropical location is uh, tomato plants are a short lived perennial plant. So they can go a whole year if they have the right temperatures and climate. So I think it kind of depends which zone you live in and how <laughs> both how cold it gets in your area and how hot it gets in your area. So for those who get really, really cold, you'll probably lose them in the winter time unless you have them in a container or you put some covering on it. And for those of us who live in the zone 10s, 11s in the Caribbean, we might lose them during the summertime just because the heat gets too extreme and they get too stressed out. But no worry, because if you got one little tomato popping on the ground, you're gonna have them come back right away. So let's talk about pests and other issues. Now, I have seen people say that these plants will go through the summertime. I find that they get massively stressed out. And I have shown on this channel before that because of the direct sunlight, even though they are heat tolerant and they can handle a lot of subtropics, the actual sunlight is what's stressing them out. And you'll see a lot of curling of leaves. They're not big fans of it. Oh, and I've shown the contrast between areas where it's getting direct sunlight in the summertime when we're hitting UV index 11 and 12 and 13 versus the areas that are more shaded and the leaves look really, really healthy and actually might still set fruit even though it's hot out, it's really the sun intensity that really challenges them in the summertime for my area. Other things to watch out for is if you don't have irrigation in the area, they may get stressed out due to drought issues. A lot of you guys who are considering if you don't have watering systems in place when we go through our drought seasons, they could get stressed out because even though they have a decent sized root system, they're only hitting about 18 inches down. So Pretty was asking, how do I keep the birds from eating all my ripe tomatoes? We can't prevent them from eating some. But one of the biggest techniques that I use for making sure that I get the majority of the harvest is I tend to harvest a little on the early side. So once I see the first two tomatoes turning orange, I will consider taking them in. Another technique is, is that, well, my general method, and I talk about this in my book, A Beginner's Guide to Florida Gardening, is that I use an integrative method. So I provide lots of food for birds that aren't my tomatoes so that they have food and support all year round. And that tends to keep them from going after my fruits and veggies because they got more of what they actually like, which is bugs. And oftentimes a lot of the reasons that birds are on your plants is they're looking for bugs. Though I don't tend to see many bugs on them other than stink bugs once we hit the high heat of summer. Semolita007 was saying, my Everglades tomatoes haven't produced as much as I would expect it. The things that you might wanna look for is you kinda gotta start back from basics. Have a plant and it's growing and it's not producing a lot. That means it's missing one of its key components. So here are some of the things you should look at. One, is it getting enough sunlight? That's gonna be direct sunlight for at least four hours. That's not dappled. That's not through a screening. At this time of year in the spring, it should be full four to eight hours. And if you're more at that four hour end, it's probably just not enough sun for them to fully produce tomatoes. 
areas. When it comes to watering, the typical irrigation systems about two times a week should be plenty. And then when it comes to nutrition, it's really gonna depend on the plant. But honestly, one of the ways you can tell is by the color of the leaves. So you can see they're very green behind me. And that's a key way of knowing that they have enough nitrogen. If you're seeing that they're a light yellow, it can mean that there's one of two things. They're not getting enough nitrogen or just in general fertilizer. The other reason you might not be getting enough fruit is because of a lack of potassium and phosphorus. So because the plant uses a lot of nitrogen, because you said that you have a plant and it's just not producing as much, I would lean more into looking at potassium and phosphorus. So this is where, when we talked about the fertilizer section, bone meals and blood meals, you can make your homemade concoctions using urine and ashes. I've done that before for certain plants. You could be using your banana peels to help with that. There's a lot of ways to get potassium and phosphorus, but if it's not setting enough fruit, it's either it's not getting enough light, it's not getting enough water, or it does not have enough potassium phosphorus. Now you may be seeing yourself, Everglades tomatoes sound amazing and I can't wait to get them in my vegetable garden, but are there any other plants that are just as easy and taste great? Well, check out this video on Seminole pumpkins right here. Okay, I'll see you soon, bye.